Hello, BookTube, and happy Monday. I have a little a wee mail haul here to start your day. Uh, I think there's more mail coming. In fact, I'd be willing to bet there's a lot more mail coming. Uh, but I figured we could all do with a mail haul to distract our mind from the events of the outside world. <laughs> I, I uh, took the morning off from Twitter uh, and then came back to an absolute mess. <laughs> so I don't know why I came back at all. Uh, and I don't, I don't take a newspaper anymore and I, I'm avoiding Google News on my iPad. It's just, let's just delve into the mail and see what fun we have. Uh, and maybe there'll be more mail today. That, that's, that would be fun. There's only, uh, I think, four packages here. Yeah, there's four packages. Uh, three are cardboard and one is airmail uh, from France, I believe. Uh, no, from Canada. Uh, so I don't know what that could be. I don't usually request anything from uh, that's not UK public or US publishing. Uh, sweet, sweet. The bean is still a little bit subdued. I think uh, she misses the sun. I certainly do. Uh, but what have we got here? What have we got here? Okay, I don't, I don't quite know what this is. This is, uh, it's, it's called The Philistine by Leela Marshy, who's a native of Montreal. She's a Canadian author. Those of you in Canada, do you know this author? Uh, let's see here. Nadia Aid doesn't know it yet, but she's about to change her life. It's the end of the 1980s, and she hasn't seen her Palestinian father since he left Montreal years ago to take a job in Egypt, promising to bring her with him. But now she's 25, and he's missing in action. Booking a short vacation from her job uh, and her boyfriend, she calls her father from the Nile Hilton in downtown Cairo. But nothing goes as planned, and stumbling around, Nadia wanders into an art gallery where she meets Manal, a young Egyptian artist who becomes first her guide and then her lover. Okay. And Leela Marshi is of Palestinian Newfoundland, Newfoundland uh, heritage. She can tell a good joke, but it bombs. <laughs> okay, which of those is which? <laughs> That's awesome. So she, she is, she, her heritage is Palestine and Newfoundland, which means she can tell a good joke, but it bombs. <laughs> and now I want to know which is which. <laughs> uh, she's been a filmmaker, a baker, an app designer, a marketer, a farmer, and the editor of an online cultural journal. Uh, she founded the Friends of Hutchinson Street, a groundbreaking community group bringing Hasidic and non-Hasidic neighbors together in dialogue. And she has published stories and poetry in Canadian and American journals and anthologies. And this is her debut. Um... Okay, I don't know how I got this, but I am intrigued. <laughs> to put it mildly, I am intrigued. Do uh, do we have any uh, any helpful dates on this thing? No, no. It's it's her debut, and it comes out. It's it's a 2018 release, but I don't have a date other than that. It's coming out as a twenty dollar paperback. Uh, could be out already, for all I know. Uh, interesting. Okay, well, it goes on the pile. Uh, I don't think I requested it, but that's all right. Uh, all right, so let's move on. We have cardboard here to do, which will please me and will please the bean. Uh, let's see. Let's see what this first one is. Uh, let's see. Oh, goodness. Oh, hang on, bean. Is there a... <laughs> Sorry. Let me grab that. There you go. <laughs> all right, as you were. Uh... Okay, so this is the University of Chicago Press. It comes out in mid-October. Bright, shiny thing. This is that, The Beautiful Cure. The Revolution in Immunology and What It Means for Your Health by Daniel Davis. Hmm. It is a rare thing for a science book to arrive in the United States riding a wave of praise as colossal as The Beautiful Cure has. Never heard of it before. But this book, recently included in the shortlist for the Royal Society Insight Investment Science Book Prize, is no dry look at medical research, and its author, Daniel Davis, is no ordinary writer. 
a leading scientist of immunology and a raconteur without peer, uh, Davis opens up opens us up to a beautiful world of our immune cells and the scientists who study them, with eyes both expert and ardent. In an area of medicine flooded with research funding and seemingly boundless hope for cures, Davis's book offers us an illuminating look at the latest scientific findings, a realistic take on what these breakthroughs will mean for our future health, and a stirring exploration of the long, unrecognized symphony that is our immune system. Hmm. Interesting. So this is all about the human immune system. I can't help but, uh, when I hear that subject, I can't help but think about uh, Kurzweil, the the uh, great science YouTube channel, uh, where the creators have a thing for the human immune system. They have a wonderful couple of videos. I'll, if I remember, I'll link them down below. They're fantastic to watch. Uh, about what happens in in the human immune system, what it is, what how how terrific it is, and uh, how it can be compromised. Those I'm, I might be saying the name of the channel wrong, but uh, the channel is well worth your time. And those are terrific videos, even by their standards. Uh, okay, immunology. That's a little bit strange. I'll have to. Uh, I'll have to. I mean, it's October. I'm going to read everything in October. <laughs> All the books in the world are coming out in October. But this this will have uh, particular resonance uh, for me because I there's been a, a large amount of research done on my own immune system. <laughs> so so I'll, I'll be right I'll be right uh, in front seat for this thing, wondering what's going on. Uh, all right, we'll move on. We have one of these uh, vacuum pressed cardboard things. <laughs> I had I had a twenty minute period last night where I suddenly felt this upswelling of uh, of missing Lucy, missing my my fat, crazy, dim-witted old basset hound that I had when I started this channel. There's nowhere for such emotions to go. They, if they if they rise up again, missing someone that you loved, missing someone like that who's not here and is never going to be here again, I'm never going to see Lucy's face again. Uh, there's nothing that can, you can do when that moment happens. It's just You just have to ride it out. Most of you, I think, are probably too young to have experienced what I'm talking about, but you will. And not only will you experience, but you will ride it out. You don't feel like you will, but you will. Uh, and I, when I felt it coming on, I thought, oh, no, I've got a whole night of work to do. But I, it's, I can still do the work, but I'm going to be miserable the whole time. And i got to tell you, <laughs> Frida fixed it pretty easily. It's, there is missing Lucy, fine. Grieving for Lucy, not so fine. I... I Never wasted any time with my little hippo. I lavished her with love and affection. I did everything I could to make her life comfortable and then to make her last two years bearable and not frightening. I couldn't have done anything else, and there were no tragedies. The, aside from, you know, her Mary Todd Lincoln insanity, there were no tragedies. There were, she, she led a long, happy, contented life where all of her needs were seen to. That's, and then it ended. And that ending is very sad. The fact that I will never sink my hands into the shag carpet of her folds of flab is sad. And there's no upside to it. It's just sad. But having, having a new person in your life who never met Lucy and who is a, just a beacon of energy all the time and upbeat, that helped a lot. I, I was noticing it last night. I gave Frida an extra treat, and she had no idea why, but that was the reason why. <laughs> because she's, uh... I had two old dogs for the longest time. I had my girls. I had Malin Moore, who was very sweet and very smart, but very timid, neurotic, easily frightened. And then Lucy, who was my basset hound, and who was... <sighs> <laughs> she's a few eggs shy of a dozen, if you know what I mean. And it had been that way her whole life. When she was younger, people would say to me, they would spend time with her, and then they would say to me in a, in a low whisper, I think there's something wrong with your past. 
<laughs> uh, and Frida has no... I mean, you know, every dog is different, and no dog is better or worse, but Frida has none of that. She has no personality defects of any kind. She's not crazy. She's as smart as I am. She's not afraid of anything. She's not willful or destructive, except to human flesh. <laughs> she's not She's not petty or resentful. It's just a... If, if I had to go through the enormous pain, the one-two punch of losing my girls one after another in a matter of months, I can't have really imagine a better person to help me through it than this little schnauzer so, so and that 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 helped right away uh and it, it that the, the reason for the digression is that it's just such an endless amount of fun to watch her tear into stuff <laughs> every single day she loves the mail now uh, but anyway what if we uh, oh oh great okay oh great uh this is uh the finished copy of something that comes out in october of course this is from da capo press by mark felton this is ghost riders uh, another book about the, uh, the Royal Lipizzaners, who were, you know, this, this extremely prized bloodline of, of show horses, who were ferried away from their normal amphitheaters where they entertain cheering crowds, uh, to a, a disused, uh, facility out in the countryside during World War II. Uh, so that they wouldn't be accidentally bombed, so that the whole line of them wouldn't be destroyed, so that they, as a national treasure, they could be preserved. But in the war's final days, the Russians were closing in from the east, all along the front, including the facility where these horses were, and the horrifying reality for uh, the Germans and for the Allies, including General Patton, who was uh, an equestrian and an enthusiast in his own right, the horrifying reality that they realized was that the Russian army would simply kill and butcher these horses for food to, to feed their men. <laughs> would just, there wouldn't be any question of, of a national treasure. They would, the horses would just be shot and, and processed for food. Uh, and so an, a rescue attempt was made. And it was the subject of an earlier book a few years ago called The Perfect Horse, which was amazingly good. And uh, this is the same subject, and I, I confess, I haven't read the advanced copy. I'm glad I have this, because I'll have to read it right away. I'm perfectly up for uh, a second book on the subject. I'm not sure what I can do in the way of reviewing it. Uh, I guess I could review it for open letters. Uh, I reviewed The Perfect Horse for the Christian Science Monitor, and I still get mail about that review. Uh, is it, I, it, I would never have picked it. My editor picked it for me, and I, I have learned to trust her judgment. And it's uh, it was a wonderful, wonderful time to read about it, and then to research it, and then to write about it. Uh, so reading about it again, be all for on um, all for, especially since I have to believe that Mark Felton has read the Perfect Horse, and is not going to write the same book. <laughs> so this will be different angles, maybe different sources. Uh, fine by me. Uh, and then we have this last one, which is a kind of a box. It's kind of a boxy envelope, and it's fairly heavy. So I'm thinking it's a finished copy of something. But maybe something that's slightly oversized. Uh, what it could be. Uh, let's, let's see here. Are you going to be able to handle this? You're just a wee little thing. Ah! <laughs> so much for a wee little thing. Well, what have we got here? Oh my. Wow. Okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, this comes out in October from Pegasus Books. I don't think I ever got an advanced copy of this. Wow, what a weird look. What a weird thing. This is uh, The Color of Time, A New History of the World from 1850 to 1960. So the, the century that includes the American Civil War, the First World War, the Second World War, the Sexual Revolution, and advent of technology. Uh, this is by Dan Jones and Marina Amaral. Dan Jones, who appeared in my Brattle book haul just today for his book on the Plantagenets. Uh, it's the history of the world. How interesting. Okay. Uh, so we get uh, the, the Wright Brothers' uh, flight at Kill Devil Hills at Kitty Hawk, and also the, the iconic World War II photo of, uh, of VE Day. Uh, so well, what have we got here, though? This is fascinating. Uh, 
A brilliant artist and a New York Times bestselling historian have combined their talents to bring to vivid life 200 photographs of the defining events and personalities of the modern world. So is this a history in photographs? Oh my god, it is! It's a history in photographs! <laughs> you get a photograph and then a historical disquisition on it. Oh boy! Okay, well that is new. Okay, great. All right, let's 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 move on here. Uh, the color of time spans more than 100 years of world history, from the reign of Queen Victoria and the American Civil War to the Cuban Missile Crisis and the beginning of the Space Age. It charts the rise and fall of empires, the achievements of science, industrial developments, the arts and tragedies of war, the politics of peace, and the lives of men and women who made history. In this collaborative, illustrated narrative, Marina Amaral has created 200 stunning images using rare photographs as the basis for her full-color digital recreations. Dan Jones's historical examination then anchors each image in its context and weaves them into a vivid account of the world we live in today. Incredible. So, incredible. So, we take the old photographs, and she digitally re reconstructs them with color. Oh. It's Thomas Edison, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> oh, wow. Let me get you... Uh, i got to show you a couple of other examples. These are just too good. Let's, in fact, get some early ones. So the, the, the presence of color uh, really... I wonder if there's a color picture of Queen Victoria. Wouldn't that be something? Uh Oh, wow. Look at that. The Great Exhibition in London, 1851. In color. <laughs> oh, come on. you got to give us a color picture of Queen Victoria. There's no way. Yes! <laughs> Look at that! Incredible! <laughs> I like how tastefully it's done, too. It's not garish. Oh, wow. It's Charles Darwin. Oh, boy, oh, boy. All right, well, I will... This is going to be something. Okay. Uh, oh, wow. Look at that. Oh, here, i got to show you this. This is a photo that is classic for being in black and white. Uh, look at that. That's a colorized version of the classic uh, Walker Evans black and white. Look at that. Wow. Okay. All right. Uh, okay, I did not see this coming at all. So this is due in October. Uh, and it is the color of time. That's the that's the explanation for the title. It's a history of the modern world. Uh, in color, there's a Mussolini <laughs> in, a, in a color himbo shot. Wow. Okay. All right. Well, I I uh, I don't know what to expect from the narrative, uh, but I I love the idea. So, <laughs> all right. So that is uh. That is it. That is our first mail haul of the day and of the week. So we have an oddity, something I did not see coming. The color of time. Uh, carefully recolored photos uh, with historical narrative. Fascinating. Then uh, Ghost Riders, about the, the uh, race to save the Lipizzaners. Then The Beautiful Cure, all about the human immune system. I'll try to remember to leave those video links down below, because they're well worth your time if you haven't seen them. Uh, and a debut novel called The Philistine, from a Montreal author. Uh, so I, I, I guess if she's a debut author, you won't have heard of her unless you've read her work in any of the literary journals that we're told she's appeared in. Uh, but anyway, so there you go. That is, uh, that is our... our uh, inaugural mail hall of the week <laughs> quite the variety as always uh so i'll wrap this up uh but i will see you soon thank you booktube